Thank you for that. That must have been Shirley. Shirley, you'll sure like me. Um, our next speaker, Ed Ting, I think it's pretty clear what he's going to speak to us about today. You may have read some of Ed's articles on product. His specialty is astroimaging. You're in grad school uh, perfecting that now? I was. I did, I did my thesis on astronomical imaging. You did your thesis yes. on it. Okay, great. So uh, please help me extend a warm Astro Assembly welcome to Ed Ting. Thank you so much for coming, folks. Um, I used to begin every talk by saying, can you hear me? And then, uh, so one time I, I, I said that, and then some guy came up to me afterwards and he said, if I can't hear you, how am I supposed to tell you? I can't hear you. It's a little bit of a hint if you ever do any speaking, just don't bother saying anything. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so I've been looking to try out some new talks, so I wrote this out. So you guys are beginning to think, so I hope you like this. Uh, let me know if you enjoy this and uh, I'll make some adjustments and we'll see how, we, how this goes. So again, I, I do have a lot of equipment. Um, I was talking with somebody outside. I own about 40 telescopes right now. <laughs> and, um, uh, that's actually not even close to the biggest collection in our club. Uh, what, I, what I'm telling people is the guys who have the really big collections tend to be really quiet about it. You kind of find about it from you know word of mouth. Uh, the guy who lives down the road from me who has 80, and there's a guy I visit who has well over 100 telescopes in his house. He's got, he's got a finish kind of, he's sort of, you, know, you climb the stair, you come up, and then it's just sort of, you know, forests of mountains and tripods and everything everywhere. So I have seen a lot of things, and um, so I developed this thing about five to buy and five not to buy. So um, let's go ahead and just get, get right into this. So number five, not to buy. I'm surprised, I'm surprised this one is controversial for some reason, but I feel very strongly about this one. Um, don't buy these electronic telescopes again. So I don't want this to be misunderstood. I am not against electronic telescopes. I think we're going to get there. I just don't think we're there yet. I don't think I don't think these things are ready for prime time just yet. I think we're very early in the process. I think the early adopters are paying a pretty hefty premium to get these things. And I don't want to pick on those things, but I on one of those, I knew within five minutes. Of playing with one of those things for the first time that uh, you probably, I, I don't think I can recommend this thing, especially at the price of these things are going for. So uh, just to show you, this is, um, that's, that I think is a unistellar EV scope. Now I had these, I took these pictures at the same time and I made very little effort to make good images. I was just kind of playing around. But um, you know, for the $3,000, I think I might Want to see something a little bit better than that? I mean, that's, that was just a camera that I had on my Star Adventure tracking tripod. Not very many frames. I just stacked them together and put that uh, together. So I don't really think we're really there yet. This is somebody's uh, Stellina that they did. That was the horse head. I and mean, it's not bad, but, it, you know, when I was growing up, the horse head was the holy grail, right? The, I guess the question was, have you ever seen the horse head? And have you ever imaged the horse head? And back in the 1970s, it was a very easy question to ask because the answer was always no. They haven't seen it, haven't imaged it. But today, the horse head is, I mean, kids are getting this now, right, with their camera lenses. So I, I don't really think we're there yet. But, so again, my, my message is, um, the, I don't think the performance is there yet. I think that um, the price is too high so far. And it, what's weird is, I mean, I, most of these, you still can't change the magnification, right? I mean, I've kept on top of, I mean, did you buy a telescope and you can't change the magnification? I mean, it's, it seems kind of weird to me. So the magnification that you get on these is fixed. And because it's fixed, and I don't know about you, if you ever played with one of these things, it's always either too high or it's too low. It's like, I wish I could back off a bit, or get a little bit closer. And what's really odd is they don't seem to be very good on the planets and the moon right now, which is strange to me because that's how you're supposed to do it. I mean, right? That's how you're supposed to do planetary and lunar imaging. You take lots of images and then you stack them in radio stacks and then it does its thing, which is allegedly what this thing is supposed to do. I'm not really seeing um, a lot of great lunar and planetary images out of these things. And that last one is the one that concerns me. So the, the products that are out there right now, they tend to be these smaller Kickstarter style companies. And if you've noticed, the major players have not gotten into the act yet. I mean, you're not seeing Cynthia Celestron and Skywatcher doing this. And I've talked to people who are in the industry and they said, we're well, kind of waiting to see how this shakes out. I mean, can we make money on this? Do people really want this kind of thing? 
you know, if the centers of the world get involved in this kind of market, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about what's going to happen um, with these smaller Kickstarter companies because they'll bring their production and their economies of scale to, to bear on this. And, you know, I, I'm concerned about what's going to happen to these smaller companies. So I, I'm getting people who write me. There, there's a guy who wrote me, and he, ha he took an 8x50 binder, and he put a chip at the end of it. And so it's got, a, you know, it's in the, the standard binder stock that you flip to your telescope, and it's an electronic finder, and it does what these things do, and it's an auto guider. And he says he can bring this thing to market for under $500. Can he do it? I don't know, but I'm hearing from people who say that, uh, that they can do this. And the one message that I'm getting from these people yes. is there doesn't seem to be a lot of cost associated with these devices. A lot of the cost you're seeing is these uh, Kickstarter companies are trying to recoup um, their startup costs. So I do want to see that you wait to see that the market will sort itself out. They could, for example, let's say you've got an 8-inch McCasser grain on uh, a tracking mount. You could put a switch on the back of the visual back, and it will put a sensor in the way, or it can move the sensor out of the way so that you can actually look through the telescope. So if they do that, you'll have a telescope that you could use both ways. You can look through it, or you can do the electronic. So if they come out with that, you know, or, you know, what's going to happen to these? And as a side note, I am a little bit concerned about the amount of e-waste we're generating here. Uh, so if you think about it, if you buy a telescope, a traditional optical telescope, and you take care of it, that thing will still be good 50 years from now. You, you take care of it, it could be good 100 years from now. You know, when, the, when they come out with the new versions of these electronic telescopes, you know, the old ones pretty much aren't worth very much. So, um, so again, Wait until the price comes down, wait until the product gets a little bit better, and wait until the market sorts itself out. I am very excited about this prospect. I just don't think we're there yet. Okay, so number five to buy is people are always asking me what eyepiece they should get. And what I always tell them is no matter what came with your telescope, it's usually a 25 millimeter eyepiece. Everybody deserves one great 25 millimeter eyepiece mm -hmm. of some kind. Now, you know, everybody has their preferences. Um, I like the 24 millimeter panoptic. You may have uh, versions of your own. And there's some kind of, you know, psychological resistance to this because I already have a 25 millimeter eyepiece and I'm looking to get something different, right? So, but no, the 25 is probably the one you're gonna use the most often. So you deserve a really great low power eyepiece. So that's one to buy. That's <clears throat> okay. Here's one that, that came to me. So I, I refer to these things as fad scopes. I mean, wow. these, these things are fads. They come and they go. And a couple of years ago, these things were really popular. I was getting flooded with requests to review these blue plastic max tubs. And those emails were very often followed by offers to give them to me. I've done this a long time, and that is usually not a good sign. Um, there are many, many different versions under many different names. And uh, I'm kind of curious as to why they chose a Maxitov design because the focal length tends to be long and what happens is the mount starts to become an issue. There's a version of this with these three little spindly legs and then they show that that smart, I mean, I don't know if you're gonna get that with, <laughs> with your smartphone. Um, so it comes with a 25 millimeter inch and a quarter eye piece, you know, like the grown up telescopes. But if you look really closely, the diameter of the visual back is 0.965. It's actually 0.965 supposed to go. So that's, uh, it's, they're either 60s or they're 70s. Okay. Okay, and, and they have many different names. Um, somebody told me they keep changing the name to Dodge Reviewers, right? So they keep, you know. So, um, so because it's a 965 in, uh, inch visual back, they have to give you a hybrid diagonal. That's usually bad news. But what makes it worse is the <laughs> diagonal is a hybrid erect image diagonal. So it, does, it tends to make it you know, just, just a little bit worse. Um, the big problem here is, of course, the mount. At 700 millimeters, the, the, you know, for $150, whatever mount they give you, you're gonna have a lot of trouble tracking, keeping things straight um, at that magnification. And, and there's a lot of misleading stuff like on the right side there. I kind of doubt you're gonna be able to get images of Saturn like that. Um, so, the fad seems to be dying down. I'm getting fewer requests uh, on this one. Okay, so number four to buy, and those of you who don't do planetary imaging, um, 
even if you have no interest in imaging, I suggest that you get one of these things, okay? They are, why? Because they are just so much fun. Um, I'll pass this around. If you don't have these things, um, that's my favorite. It's, uh, do you need a pointer? I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. So if you want to go with another manufacturer, that's fine. These are the two that I have. The MC is the color. The MM is the monochrome. And they're only $150 each. Even if you don't do astronomical imaging, these are useful at Skywatches because I will bring that and a laptop on a tracking mount and I will show the moon to many people, you know, as they're looking. It's a different way to see things. So I've always been fascinated by this aspect of astrophotography because it is so wild and wacky and different from anything else that you're used to seeing. Um, and again, they have many different versions. So the conventional wisdom is that astrophotography is all of those things, right? <clears throat> so when I'm saying that this is actually fun, I mean, the words fun and astrophotography <laughs> don't usually go together, right? <laughs> um, so that was at the Black Forest Star Party a few years ago, speaking out there. And that is a BRC 300 Takahashi or something. It's an RC. Uh, and by the way, um, those of you who are Takahashi fans, if you have one of the really nice Takahashis, it's signed on the dew shield, the, the, guy, the Japanese guy who makes it, and nobody can pronounce his name. So he just signs it Rocky. I don't know if you can say it. It's like Rocky on the dew shield. So if you have a Rocky Takahashi, you know, like people will like, come see it, right? Um, so I, I do this talk a lot for beginners, and I always tell them, if you see lots of wires hanging off of a telescope, it's usually because it's used especially, especially for imaging. And of course, as we all know, it's a, it's a criticism of our hobby today that um, people don't look through their telescopes anymore, and I'm guilty of that myself. I have two or three telescopes at home that I, I'm sad to admit I've never looked through them. So one of these days, I'm going to get them out in the drive and actually you know, say that I, I look. And you get a telescope, oh, I wonder what the images look like for this thing, right? So I can't afford one of those BRC 300s, so I did the next best thing, which is I took a picture of myself. <laughs> <laughs> So webcam astrophotography is all of those things and relatively fun. So why does all this work? I, I'd love to meet the guy who figured this thing out, okay? You, what you do is you don't take a still image, you take a video. But video is just a series of still images put together and then they run them together so in your mind it looks like it's a movie thing. So some of those stills in the video will be sharp, some of them will be blurry, and some of them will be in between. So we have three pieces of software like Registax and AutoStacker, which will sort through your video, stack the sharp ones and throw the blurry ones away. And you can set that threshold and peek out to your heart's delight on that. Because noise tends to be random, the more stills you can stack together, the noise will have a tendency to cancel itself out. And so the signal gets stronger the more you stack. I find this interesting. Um, that is from a Celestron catalog I had in 1981, you know, but when I was a kid, I just sit there and read those catalogs, right? And we didn't have any money, so I just read the catalogs. But, uh, so that, the, the image on the left of Copernicus is through an old Celestron C90, um, that's a film image. The image on the right is through a C14. So that's an image of Copernicus. I wasn't even trying hard, that was a test image that I took uh, through a I think it was an 8-inch LX200 or something like that. But you can see just how much things have advanced since then. And I'd like to show this because those images on the left, I took those through uh, a 12-inch F15 Warner and Swayze refractor at the University of Illinois where I went did my undergrad. Um, and it's a refractor from 1897. It's, it was said to be the model for Yerkes. They scaled it up to do Yerkes. But those images on the left that you see there of Jupiter and Saturn, those were so good they made the club newsletter. So you can see how much things have changed since then. And so the hero of this scenario is the lowly webcam. And again, I'd love to meet the guy who first figured this out, but if you remember when, you know, when they first started to have webcams, that, that ball on the top of your monitor, remember they used to have those things? People, when people figured this out, they were ripping those things off the top of their monitors and then you go into the bathroom and you get the cord from the toilet tissue roll, and then you sleeve it down to inch and a quarter, you duck the whole thing together, and you shove it down into your focuser. And they were doing this, and they, what was fascinating is they started getting images that were better than anything that had ever been taken before. 
I mean, people were talking like 320 by 240 CGA webcams were getting images that were better than anything that had been done before because the ability to stack and the ability to get high frame rates is more important than all that other stuff that conventional photographers care about. You know, the megapixel the count and the bit depth and all this stuff. So this kind of imaging is counterintuitive. In fact, even today, you'll see these Philips 2 cams and the SPC 900, which I think is just a modification, but you'll see, still see these things for sale. They'll fetch some money. People want to experiment with them. Okay, so these are just some images that I took. Um, we don't have great seeing around here, so it's kind of hard to get really great images consistently here. Um, so there's a club member we have named Herb, and Saturn takes 29 and a half years to go around sun and so it was suggested to me that I go out at the same time every year and take an image at the same time and then at the end I'll have 29 images that I can you know, kind of, I'll do something cool with it so I don't want to think about how old I'm going to be when all this is done <laughs> uh, but Bert has a head start on us that's from 2004 to 2023 and you would think this would be a simple thing well I'll just go out at the same time every year and take an image well it's not quite that simple because if you stop to think about it what kind of a camera were you using in 2004? Mm -hmm. kind of a camera were you using in 2007? See, every three or four years, there was a complete turnover in the equipment and in the technique. So there's actually quite a bit of adjustment there. And I think 2010 is my favorite there. I, he actually, it was a clear night during one of the two or three nights of the year when the rings appeared to disappear. And I kind of wish he'd left it like that. He wanted to wait until the rings would open up a little bit. I kind of wish that he had done that. And you can have a lot of fun with this. Um, that's an H alpha solar image. <clears throat> uh, the image on the lower right is a calcium K image that I took uh, through my stowaway, I believe. And sorry, here. so if you've never used a calcium K diagonal, it's a purple diagonal that you stick in any telescope. And the problem with calcium K is that band is just at the edge of human perception. So the older you are, you know, I'm 59 years old now, I couldn't see anything. So you get a younger person and this, oh, that looks really cool. The sun's purple and it's got sunspots in it, right? Uh, there's also an older club member about my age who got cataract surgery. And he says, now we can see it again. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to do this, um, even on a laptop, because you can't, it's kind of hard to focus on it. It's like, um, I would have one of those. I borrowed one. I would have one, except the diagonal is sixteen hundred dollars. Well, I get sixteen hundred dollars. What's the use out of that? So these are these are through eight and ten inch uh, LX two hundreds. There's so I use this as a teaching tool, right? So when I do this with kids, and I'll point out that Clavius is a crater with a lot with crater craterlets inside. You see, it starts small and they get bigger, sort of like a horn of plenty thing. And uh, no reason they have to be that way, but it's interesting to us that Clavius, about 120 miles of diameter, is shaped that way. This is Copernicus. Copernicus is a very distinctive feature in it. There's two peaks in the middle, and there's sort of like stadium seating on the outside. <laughs> and then there's, I can never remember these, there's Ptolemaeus and Arzachal and the, the, the third. Yeah, thank you. See, so the Greek names, I never remember them. Everybody just calls it Snowman. Right, so, so you said snowman is upside down. So I'll do this with kids a lot. I'll say, okay, now you can see Clavius, right, with the ringlets, right? And then you can see Copernicus with the two peaks in the middle. And you can see the snowman. So you try to get to keep those three things in your head. And uh, what I'll do is I'm saying, and kids always find them first. I don't know why this is. The way their brains work, the kids always find the stuff before the adults do. So there's Clavius down here. There's Copernicus. Here's the snowman. Now, this was taken through a five inch Schmidt grain, and you'll notice the chip on the camera that's going around is pretty small. It will not cover the entire frame of the moon. So, what you have to do is you take a picture of the moon, and then you move the telescope, you take a picture, and then you kind of do 20% overlap on the matrix all the way down. And then you process all the images, and you throw the thing into some sort of image composite editor and come out with this. Usually, I don't get to that till the next morning because of the amount of labor involved. And sometimes when you do this, what happens? You make a mistake. Can anybody point out the mistake in this image? See, all I see is the mistake when I look at this. Is it the 
good little chip there. Yeah, I missed a spot. Yep. I missed a spot. <laughs> ah, it's the monolith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone pointed out I could sample a piece of the thing turning around and put it back in, but you know, I don't know, right? I don't know. It's crazy. And uh, so you, you now this happens to you. That's fun. That's the monolith. That's a monolith too. Yeah. So I th I think the next slide is just a, because it's a video. People have asked me, "Has anything interesting ever happened to you while you're attempting to do one of these?" Hopefully this works. Okay. So you have to look carefully because oh, yeah. this is obviously unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'd be exhausted. After. Yeah. yeah. One more time. Uh, shoot. Whoops. So if you know who Damien Peach is, he's probably the best in the world at this. And I, I've asked him how he does this because he does it with a 12 and a half inch Newtonian that I think is semi homemade. And he's determined that the best place to do this is Barbados. So what he does is, I, I don't know about you, I went to Barbados, I'd be on the beach all day, but he does the opposite. He, he sleeps during the day and at night he gets out this 12 and a half inch thing and he does, his, he does his thing. And I've asked him like, how do you get that thing to Barbados? It's not, it's not a tube in section, but do you ship it? Do you put it on the plane? And he says he gets some sort of special permission as a scientific something to get it in the plane. Like they'll actually take it and they won't charge him that much. Mm -hmm. So he does this from Barbados and this is uh, every, I don't know how many minutes for, whoops, I'm not, maybe not. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm flabbergasted. I, I don't know how he does that. It's humbling, isn't it? Anybody who does this kind of thing? <laughs> but it goes all the way around. I've seen some of his images where he gets detail on the on Jupiter's moons. I mean, what? Like, what? How many arc seconds is the moon? Is the moon? <laughs> okay, so here's something. If you live in this area, um, I grew up in Attleboro. I live in southern New Hampshire now. And depending on how you define a clear night, it's it's good enough to do this about one in every four or five nights, right? So, what are the odds? Here that you get uh, fourteen clear nights in a row. Zero. It's in the millions. It's one over millions. <laughs> and of course, I didn't realize it at the time when I was doing this. This is a cheap Celestron C90 I was using. And I was just goofing off during the first four or five images. And so I'm looking around. I'm like, hmm. I'm looking at the forecast. I wonder, like, how well, how much I can keep going. So uh, of course, after the full the moon is full, I'm getting up after midnight to do these things, and I'm like. Is this really worth it? <laughs> but I have a I have an image of this that's about um, eight or ten feet long. It's hanging in my kitchen. Um, the, the top one is the lower one on the left. Had to go undergo a lot of post processing because it's raining as I'm taking that image. I had an umbrella over my mouth, and there was a sucker hole right on the horizon where the moon came. I got she's just enough to get it. But if you were to look really closely, that one on the lower left is no good. Um, Emil Krakow from the Netherlands. He has a friend who he says has developed this stupid human trick. His stupid human trick is he can grab the front of a Dobsonian telescope and track it at the rate of the International Space Station. <laughs> I don't know how you learn this skill or why you would spend so much time doing this, but that's what he did. He uses one of these cameras and it just tracks the International Space Station like that. And he's, his equipment is nothing special. I mean, that's it, it looks like an old eight inch star finder from me and the cows watch him do this. Um, he's quite good at this. Um, Christopher Go, of course, you all know about. Okay, Th number okay, number three, not to buy. I've been getting asked this a lot lately. There is a ten-inch Explorer Scientific trust tube dog being sold in places like Costco and B and H and Amazon and some other places. Um, there are a couple of these in the club, and if they're all like this one, you really, I mean, if the problem is it looks kind of good, doesn't it? It looks kind of like a real something you could use until you start to use it. Avoid this thing. Um, I'm pretty sure whoever designed this thing has never used a telescope in their entire lives because we were putting this thing together. Uh, I had a friend in the club say, you want to review this? I'll bring it over. And I said, sure, bring it on over. He says, um, well, wait, I have to fix five things on it before I bring it over. And I said, wait, what, fix, fix five things? Like, it's, it's broken? Oh, no, 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 it's fine. I just have to fix five things. 
And again, I've been doing this a long time, and I knew right then and there this was not going to be good. So I'll run through some of the things that are going to torpedo your whole experience here. The base, the, the ground board on the on the dog is too small. It's it's it needs to be two or three times the size. And when the bit when the base board is too small, and you try to move it, you pull the whole thing over. We, we, you had to get really good with like you know, really careful. And every once in a while, you grab it by mistake, you know, almost pull the whole thing over. Hmm. That black thing here is a hinged cover. And you'd think this is a good idea that we put a cover on the mirror, but part of the reason that you have a cover on a dog is so that you have something covering the mirror when you're putting it together, right? So you don't want anything falling on the mirror. If you close that cover, it covers up the places where the truss falls go. You can close the mirror, but then now you can't assemble a telescope. So one of the things you had to do was make another mirror cover for the telescope. Um, this piece here, I don't understand what it is. It looked like it was two pieces. It usually had to be one solid piece of metal or wood, but it was actually, on his it was actually two. So there's a seam in the middle. So as you're pulling your thing up and down, it's like you're driving over a speed bump. It goes ka -dum, ka -dum, ka -dum, ka -dum, and you just drive you crazy. Okay. Um, it's the most front heavy dog I've ever seen in my life. Um, <clears throat> with no eyepiece in it, if you just let go, the thing will dive down pretty fast, which means you have to put a weight on the back, which they don't include. And let's see if I get this. Okay, so that is the weight kit that they put on the back. And the problem with that is, and it may not be obvious when you see it, but please, when you're really making a telescope, you know, don't stick things out the side or the back of the telescope. Your clothes are going to snag on it. The wires are going to snag on it. But that's not the strangest thing of all. The strangest part of this is the collimation. So you know when a dog, the collimation is in the back, but most reflectors like normal, okay? They did the opposite. They put the collimation screws in the front. So here's the mirror, and then there's, it, it's sort of an Allen key thing. And because you can't get down there, they give you this metal probe. I don't know if you can see that in the lower left. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're getting a, a, a metal probe with an Allen key head in it, and you're poking at the mirror inches away <laughs> in the dark. <laughs> so, and the one that we had, it was so stiff that we were afraid it was going to come loose and then just, you know, which it did a couple of times, it came loose, we needed the mirror. But, um, <coughs> the counter argument to this is, yeah, but it's only 650, it's only 599, I'm getting a 10 inch dollar. Well, if you're good with woodworking and if you know telescopes and if you're willing to pretty much rebuild the thing from the ground up, it might be a good investment for you. But I'll point this out to you. So at the top, it was $5.99. I have seen that thing on Amazon for as little as $188. Wow. It, it comes in and out of Amazon. And whenever it comes in, I order one because I'm an idiot, I guess. I just, okay. It never shows up. So the last time I ordered it, Amazon refunded my money 24 hours later with no explanation. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. But if you keep looking, it, it does show up from time to time at under $200. You want to try it yourself? Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> I have been searching for beginner's telescopes for a very long time. And for the longest time, the stuff we recommend has not changed for like decades, right? It's Orion Shore Tube, it's Star Blast or Z414 or whatever they're calling it now. It's four and a half or six inch dogs. Um, I ordered this just as a uh, an impulse buy off Orion because they came out with three of these recently. There's a 134 F5 something reflector. There's an F114 F4 refract reflector, and then there's a 90 millimeter refractor. I think $250. So I bought this thing, and I'm expecting nothing. And as I'm putting it, to, first of all, the box comes in, and the box is bigger and heavier than I expected. It's a good sign. As I'm putting it together, that mount. Because the cheap scopes, what does those in is the mount, right? It's the optics are usually serviceable. It's the mount that does it in. Um, they actually completely redesigned these cheap mounts, like those EQ ones and EQ twos that we've all been putting up with for far too long. This is better. It's actually usable, and I've got a video coming out on this thing. But I really couldn't find anything wrong with this for the money. So the only thing that I might caution you against. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm splitting hairs at this price range or not, um, is that focuser. It's a plastic focuser, and you look at, look at how high profile that thing is. The, um, the eyepiece is sitting something like seven inches off the top of the thing, so it, you know it's sticking out, you know, like bumping against something. I don't know if you're going to be able to find a replacement for that if you break that. Um, 
the draw tube looks like it's metal. It's actually plastic that's painted chrome. And so if you if you reef down too much of the knob, you can strip those gears. It is a concern. I'm, it's they have got almost everything else right. The rings and the plate are first rate. I they almost can't get any better on the rings and the plate. So I know they can do it, but they put a plastic focuser on it. I'm hoping in Mark II version, maybe they'll fix that. But, you know, uh, Ryan Starblast also has a plastic focuser on it, and it doesn't come with a mount. You have to find something to set it on. So for $250, I found them on Ryan's clearance section for under $200. Okay, so I'm happy that I have something else, beginner, that I can recommend to people. Um, the the IP says super on it. Okay, well, okay, let's give it one piece of marketing. It's a super. It's They're awfully light. <laughs> Okay, so here's one. So I'm actually thinking about doing a video called Five Controversial Opinions That I Have. <laughs> and one of the controversial opinions I have is that don't count on electronic mounts of any kind being 100%. Because I think that beginners, they see the ads and they'll see like, oh, if I buy this $300 go-to telescope, <laughs> it'll go to 64,000 objects by itself. And then they're disappointed when it doesn't do that. And what I find is when beginners don't have success with those mounts, they have a tendency to blame themselves. What they'll say is, you know what? I must not be doing that right. You know, that the manual said I had to level the tripod, and I didn't level the tripod. And that must be why it's not working. Well, no, I mean, I never level my tripods, folks. <laughs> okay. Um, and I don't mean to pick on those guys. Um, I've said things, I go back and forth on that next star. I think I find some really good ones that are good, and then I find ones that are like, what was that? <laughs> I've got a next star right now, and it's really good, but it's been back to Celestron three times. Um, so, I mean, ETX, I'm, I've talked a lot about those things. And again, they run hot and cold, but I'll see some really good ones, and I'm like, well, maybe I can just say I can recommend these things. And then I'll see a couple like, I don't think I should have left the factory the way, the way that thing was in. So, um, what I find with beginners is beginners are very often surprised to learn that they will sometimes sell stuff that doesn't work. And when I was younger, it was the 675 power 50 millimeter refractor, right? That, that's what you're going to do with it. You're going to pump that thing up to 675 power and it would never work, right? It seems like these days it's the cheap electronic mount that sometimes doesn't work, right? You know? Um, and even some of the most expensive stuff that you can buy will occasionally fail. These are computers, they glitch, they crash, they have to be reset, you gotta reset them to the factory settings. Every once in a while, you're gonna to have to do these things. Um, I had a friend, I have a friend right now with a Paramount. Now, Paramount is a quote unquote dumb mount. There's very little electronics in Paramount. All the brains are in your computer. It failed on it. He's got an astrophysics Honda's on it. We gotta get up there and get an 80 pound thing off the, off the, uh, off the mount. I um, have another friend flew to Costa Rica with an AP-130 and one of, the big, one of the big AP mounts. It worked for a night and then it stopped working. This is an astrophysics mount. And he was on the phone with George for, I don't know, hours. And where he was in Costa Rica, there was no cell phone coverage. But he had the wherewithal to bring a satellite phone with it. What does a satellite phone cost per minute? For hours? But he, he said he could, he could hear the dollar signs going in his head as he's talking to George. It took hours to fix the problem, he fixed it. But um, what else is he gonna do, right? Gonna not use it, you, you gotta do it. So even the best stuff will occasionally fail. Um, so I'm often asked what I think about LX200s. I think those are usually pretty solid buys. I would tend to steer you towards buying those new as opposed to used. So here's what I find, and uh, maybe Tony can back me up on this. I find those LX200s, once you get those things beyond eight or nine years, I just kind of write them off in my head. <laughs> because if somebody offers me an older LX200, I mean, I'll pay what I think the optical tube is worth, and then the mount, if it works, fine. If not, you know, I, if it works for now, I don't expect it to work. Um, I, I have an upcoming video, I think it might even be coming up tomorrow, as a matter of fact, but I go through some of the LX200s, the 7-inch Mac, the 8, the 10, and the 12-inch McCaskery, as you see a forest of things around me. Um, all four of those, when I got them, we're dead. <laughs> now, they're all more than 10 years old, but each one of them seems to have a kind of quirk that doesn't really, you know, it, it, I don't know, the 8-inch had a bad declination board. Um, they don't support that anymore. So if, if you're going to pay a lot of money for an older LX200, ask yourself the question, if 
it fails, you know, soon, a year from now, whatever, and you can't fix it, are you still happy with the price that you paid? You know, um, the 12 inch was older and there are two tantalum capacitors in the keypad and there's one behind the drive board. It's an electrolytic capacitor. Those need to be replaced. And the problem is when capacitors haven't been fired up in a while, they sometimes can blow and they're mounted very close to the circuit board and they can take out part of the circuit board. It's an older model. You're looking at buying used parts online. So I don't love saying this kind of thing, uh, but it is something to watch out for. Um, I find that the lower you go in cost, the worse things tend to get. Um, okay, enough about that. Oh, I'll say this too. Um, so not long ago, <clears throat> I had in for review a certain go-to mount, and I was going to do a review for a certain well-known astronomy magazine. Um, we had to terminate the review. It, the, the particulars aren't important, but it was an inexpensive mount, and I, it's very rare that I get a product in that's just a zero. I, I mean, nothing. I get nothing. Uh, I, it was so bad that I became convinced or half convinced that maybe I was doing something wrong. And uh, so I, I called a friend over, and. I said, I, I haven't said anything to anybody yet. I'm gonna just bring your tablet over, sit in the driveway and just do whatever you want, I'll be inside. He comes in an hour and a half later and he's like, yeah, nothing. Um, so the person at the manufacturer, I think was trying to do damage control and he tried to imply that maybe I wasn't using it right. And he said, I guarantee you the problem is that you're letting the thing time out on your tablet. And I'm like, no, 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 it, 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 it didn't work at all. I didn't get that far, it didn't work at all. And the second thing about this statement is, so if you think about it, he's admitting that he knows there is a problem with the thing timing out, <laughs> right? Um, I had, well, I hate, the, I hate the name names, but that Orion series mount and the HEQ5 series mounts, gosh, this is just me. I have never personally seen one of those things working. Okay, the variant in the US is called the Orion series, and I know they do work because people I know and respect have them and tell me that they work. I'm just telling you, I've never seen one working. So the last two Orion series mounts that I had, and I wanted the C9 and a quarter that he had on it. That's what I wanted, but he wouldn't sell it to me unless he sold me the mount, which kind of tells you something right there. <laughs> and so I got it and, and it just doesn't work, right? So I put it up for sale and I was pretty open. I thought about what I thought about the mount. And somebody who came over, he said, um, well, I read on the internet that this is the best mount. Somebody said it was the best mount. He said, well, I'm not going to sell it to you until we use, I want to show you. It was a clear night out. So I do the alignment, do the two-star align, and it's just way off. It doesn't work. I, I cycle power to the mount. I give him the controller. I, wa I wanted him to do it. Two reasons. Number one, I wanted him to see that it didn't work. And number two, maybe this guy knows something I don't, and I'm using it wrong. Okay, so he does the, does the alignment, and his alignment's worse than mine. I thought what happened next was interesting. He thought about it for a while, and he decided to believe what he read on the internet, as opposed to what he was seeing with his own eyes. I'll take it. So, okay, I've done everything I can. To take it. Um, several years later, I asked a mutual acquaintance, you know, what, whatever happened with that guy? Yeah, he never got to work. So, <laughs> um, I'm not telling you not to buy that mount. I'm just saying, for my money, I would not buy one of those. <laughs> okay, so, so this is an obvious one. As, Number two to buy is books. And those are, of course, the prototypical books to buy. I still, I have two sets of these. I have an upstairs set and a downstairs set. Because if, if, the, if the urge strikes me to read Burnham's Celestial Handbook or to dip into it, I don't want to have to climb or descend stairs to get in my way of me looking in that book. Um, the guy, I don't, he writes like a poet. He's re referencing mythology and literature and opera and religion, and philosophy and all these uh, music and all these sort of things. Um, some of the, the scientific data in there is, you know, it's a little off because he was doing all he was doing all this himself. But that's one of my favorite books of all time. So I'll just go through a couple of these. Uh, we all know that book on the upper left here. This is the latest version of Turn Life at Orion. So if you want to take a look at that, um, that's my favorite beginner's book on finding stuff. Um, the Stars by H. A. Ray. So you know, this book here. By the by, the um, creator Curious George. There's an HA Ray Cultural Center in Waterville Valley, New Hampshire. I'm a regular speaker up there. It's a Ray Cultural Center. The observatory behind there is empty, and it uh, the the dome slit doesn't work. 
they can store junk in it right now. Um, they're trying to raise some money to revive that thing, and I hope they do at some point. But inside, there is all sorts of peer restored memorabilia, including some memorabilia on that particular book. So Hans and Margaret Ray wrote the Curious George series uh, in Paris days, and they had it finished days before the Nazis came in, fled the Nazis from Germany on their bicycles, carrying the Cur Curious George manuscript with them, and it's wound up in South America and in some places in the Northeast here. So that is the H.A. Lincoln Cultural Center. Um, Planospheres, like we all have planospheres. This one's my favorite. Mm -hmm. The problem with planospheres is they're usually too small, right? Mm -hmm. They've only got like 100 stars on them. This one's, a, it's almost like a mini atlas. Like, I like this. Like, you can actually use this thing. And it's got some useful data on the back, um, like $40 or so. $20 at Barnes & Noble. $20 at Barnes & Noble, excellent. Even better. All right. Um, my favorite small atlas. Now, I used to use the Cambridge Star Atlas, and I like that a lot. But this has become my favorite. This is Sky and Telescope's pocket atlas, but it's the jumbo edition. And it sounds kind of a, like an oxymoron. It's a pocket atlas, but it's the jumbo edition. But they, it's one of the few non-Wiltarian illustrated star atlases out there. But this is the one that I use the most often. And that's, that one's getting kind of worn out. Um, I'm going to be getting another one at some point. So here's the so here's the thing. Does anybody know for sure what's happening with William and Bell? They fell to the AAS, but they, but they don't have a lot of stuff. Okay, but did Sky and Telescope was that were they involved at some point? AAS owns Sky and Telescope. Okay, Blackstar. But I don't see a lot of titles coming out, so I don't. There's a I mean there was an incredible backlog of catalog of books in the William yeah. Bell. Okay, so yeah, this is frustrating to me because I have like a book proposal I want to send out to somebody and I was going to send it to them. I have no idea if I could be sending it to them or not. Um, this was one of my favorites. And even if you have no interest in binocular astronomy, uh, Will Terry used to have this thing called the Bright Star Atlas. It was 16 pages. So this book at the time was $19 and the Bright Star Atlas was $19. This has the Bright Star Atlas in the back of it. So I copy those and then I laminate. So um, this book, I wasn't interested in Messier Marathon before this book. Harvard Pennington sadly passed away. This is the best book I have found to teach you how to find things fast. Okay, because you have five minutes and 38 seconds on average to find every object in a Messier Marathon. He teaches you how to do it. Um, this story book, I like it a lot. Again, the Wilman Bell stuff, I, I just don't know. It's, it's, yeah. So if, if you're a, if you're a little bit beyond the beginner stage, there's two books I really like to geek out on, and again, these are both Will Wilman Bell books. This one's Star Testing Astronomical Telescopes. So you know that star test we do when we're at the focus right now and you look at the images? This is a whole book where you get to geek out on that. And you wouldn't think he could sustain 200 pages worth of your interest. He does. It just makes you want to go out and touch your telescope. And then this one, Telescope Optics, this is this is a really good one to geek out on. Also. Um, number one, not to buy. So I had a lot of questions on this because there are worse telescopes than the Celestron Power Seeker 127, but this one gets everybody's ire because it sells so well. And there are so many of those things out there. Um, People have asked me what happened to that sample because if you watch the video, um, the guy who loaned this to me made no effort to get it back. And I said, I conclude the video by saying, No such luck, you're getting this back. <laughs> so the finder, the finder is interesting, it's labeled as a five by 24, but look at the field stuff. What's that about 10 millimeters worth of finder there? I mean, your human eyes, what seven millimeters, and it's got better optics than that thing does. Um, so these are the accessories, and I thought I'd pass these around. But when you get this, um, there's a feel how feel the how light the Barlow lens is, and the 20 millimeter eyepiece. I don't need it. <laughs> That's called a variable focus. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the lens is actually tilted sideways in it. I don't know how to. I, I could probably get a screwdriver and try to oh, okay. get it straight. 
Um, so it's 127 millimeters, but it's got a thousand millimeter bubble length on it. And if you can look, there is no way that thing is a thousand millimeters long. Right. So there's that Barlow lens and the focuser with the Bird Jones type design. It's poorly executed. They're very difficult to collimate. If you try to collimate it, um, when it, you don't know if it's the lens that's throwing off your collimation. If you try to take it out, now the focus plane has changed, but the focuser no longer finds correct focus. If you try to put it back in, it's kind of hard to put it back in in the same direction it came out in. So yeah, don't buy this. Okay, so number one is, of course, people are tired of hearing me say this. Just get a six or eight inch Dobsonian reflector. It's chip. It's simple. It's cheap. It'll last you a long time, possibly even forever. For four hundred and fifty to six hundred and fifty dollars, even with inflation today, still pound for pound, dollar for dollar, the best thing you can buy. And I had a recent video where I compared all of those together. That's the four and a half, the six, the eight, the ten, and the twelve and a half. So I believe that is the end. Oh, right. <laughs> questions after that. <laughs> Next time, questions? Or, or, oh, yeah. I'll do whatever do you, you have time. I, yes, I'll try to answer. I don't know everything. Yes, yes. Uh, see, uh, to your number five, five, five uh, CWO has a C star. Uh, $399. Yeah. I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. I, I, so the thing, the, the, it's the, I think the four it's four nine nine. Nine. Oh, we'll pass the introduction to sale period. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. That and the dwarf, I'm putting in the same category because people will say, well, the dwarf, yeah, it kind of works and it kind of doesn't work. But people, will, they'll always come back and say the same thing. It's only $700. So it's like, I don't know if the price should be the major selling point of a particular product. <laughs> I mean, I'm holding out hope, but I'm trying to get my hands on one of those. But I would like to, I would like to see if that thing. Uh, I mean, the Stellene at four thousand. That's that's tough sell. Yeah. That's, I think the new the new EV scope is forty eight hundred or something like that. It's, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Questions, comments, anything? Yes, Tony. So, Ed, um. One of the things you said is like really uh, struck my ears up is a lot of people, beginners, they buy a computerized telescope. And, um, and I think a lot of them say that they're going to teach them the sky. Right. Actually. All right. And then a lot of times, like you said, they fail. And and they, and they think they're doing something wrong. And they'll spend all night trying to get the thing to work. Yeah. And, and I tell people this all the time. 50% of the time, a lot of these go-tos don't work. Yeah. You know, they, they, I call them almost two. And yeah, that doesn't matter if you broke it So um, I tell them, you know, get a dog, yeah. spend the money on a dog, and, and learn the sky, and join a club. Yeah. You know, yeah. The catch-22 is in order for the, for, you, for the telescope to teach in the night sky, you have to teach it part of the night sky. It's right. a catch-22. And I, I don't know what your experience is, but I had a guy write me recently. He bought a 12 inch LX200. I think $6,800. But it's 3,000 millimeters of focal length. And he says it doesn't find all the objects all the time. Your experience as well? Yeah. And, when, and then the GPS, the GPS is no longer being supported. So if the GPS, there's no parts. Yeah. So you, and those, the motherboards go, which is not, what the power bit on the LX200. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can't fix it. Yeah. So at least the LX two hundred, the classics, you can still fix. Yeah. About seventy five percent of the time, maybe still Yeah. Mind, but, but the thing is, a beginner buying would think if I spend seven thousand dollars on a telescope, it's going to find fifteen four thousand oh, yeah. objects, and we kind of know it sort of doesn't. You know. <laughs> yes, Mark. Yeah. So just you know, other ATM members here yeah. tonight. So at least once a month, there's an email from someone outside the club. That was posted and asked, uh, "Can someone teach me how to run my telescope?" And it's almost always one of those telescopes you 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 posted. Mm -hmm. You know, go to if you can't find anything. So yeah. Obviously, it's my fault. Someone teach me how to use. Yeah. So whenever someone asks me which telescope they should buy, and I get a lot of those questions. I say, <laughs> "Go to a star party, go to the clubhouse, look through a bunch of telescopes, and ask some questions, and then you know what to get and what not to get." Bob, well, yes. Couple of comments about go to alternatives I find work really well. 
and that's push to. I use Nexus digital setting circles. You put them on a robust mount. Now you're not relying on electronics and cheap motors to push that telescope around. Just the input. And I find it extremely accurate. I, I Bluetooth it to my iPad. I got Sky Safari with a beautiful detailed map that I can zoom in on. And I just, I have it on a G11 mount and I have it on a small tablet mount. And I just move to the object and it's perfect. Now an even low tech solution to this is a Telrad finder because you can use Sky Safari in your iPad and put a projection of a Telrad right on the screen. Yep. And I'll just position the outer ring. I'm looking for an object. I, I'll know, like, in, for an example, I put the outer ring of the Telrad at the 11 o'clock position. The object that I'm looking for will be on my 12 inch dock. So, no electronics, just <laughs> other than what's on my iPad and a simple Telrad. So you don't have to have these junky little plastic gears, cheap little you know motors that they put on a lot of this stuff, and they just turn the failure left and right. It's so frustrating. We get a lot of people coming up from the public. And they say we uh, need some help learning this how to use the telescope, and I'll see the telescope, and I'm like, oh my god. And the power seeker ones, those Joan Bird, I just tell them, there's not a thing I can do for you. There's nothing salvageable. I'm sorry you got stuck. Yeah, I, that new Celestron star sense thing that holds your phone, that's the first one of those things I found that kind of works. Yeah. Uh, I was I was expecting that maybe, I don't have to give you bad news, but it actually worked. Um, the only thing is, I, some people are telling me some of the newer Samsung phones don't like the, the rolled steel tube next to it for some reason. That's yeah. the explanation, explanation it doesn't work. Um, but you know, that, well, why, why can't I just download the app and put it on, on any telescope? Well, the reason is if there's a download code that they give you, and that's what you're paying for. Right. Yeah. So, and it's like a 400 megabyte download. I mean, it's like it's big. There's a lot of information. <clears throat> so, yeah. The um, you can get um, um, Sky Safari and run it at six on the phone and run it in six has the AR and yeah. you can mount it on your telescope it does the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fourteen dollars. Fourteen dollars, yeah. <laughs> Seven doesn't work. <laughs> Anything else? I'll be up here for a little while. So thank you very thanks much. Thanks so much for